Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's Research America Alliance uh, webinar. We are so grateful for you joining us and, as always, for your partnership. Um, and I am so happy to have with us today former Congressman Bart Gordon. He is the Vice Chair of Research America's Board of Directors and so, so much more. Um, during his almost three decades in Congress, Congressman Gordon served as both chair and ranking member of the House Science Committee. He also played a lead role in establishing ARPA-E, um, really shaping it from the ground up. Um, and he's going to speak with us today about key features of ARPA-E. And um, let me just go through some, and you know how that may relate to ARPA-H. Um, let me go through some housekeeping very quickly because um, you've heard it before. Um, but if you wouldn't mind, um, as you think of them, type your questions into the Q&A box. After um, Bart and I talk for a little while, we're gonna turn to Terry Schwartzbeck to do the Q&A portion of our very short, unfortunately, half an hour. Um, but Congressman, thank you so much for joining us today. And um, if you wouldn't mind, let me um, start with how, how did ARPA-E come about? Well, I asked the National Academies of, uh, of Science to do a report on the, the really the, the challenges of the 21st century and make suggestions. And this was when I was chairman of the Science Committee. And one of those suggestions was ARPA-E, that there needed to be a high risk, high reward element within the Department of Energy to make breakthroughs uh, in energy. And at that time, you have to remember, um, we were very concerned about energy independence. This was before fracking, all those sorts of things. And so I was able to um, really just take that suggestion. And then uh, DARPA seemed like the best model. So we talked to folks at DARPA, we talked with a variety of other people and put together a, a program that we called ARPA-E. Uh, I'm excited about what it's done and we're not gonna be able to even touch the surface today. Yeah. So I recommend that anybody that wants to learn more about it, uh, go to their website, uh, ARPA-E. And many of the lessons and, uh, are relevant to uh, ARPA-E, but they're not all. Um, and I'll also point out, there is also a discussion now about ARPA-C, ARPA Climate. And yeah. so um, uh, these are exciting times and uh, I'm looking forward to being a part of that conversation and seeing some great results. Um, Congressman, when you were conceptualizing this and, and trying to build something that was based on DARPA, but also kind of against this goal, a, a different, uh, a more defined goal. I think DARPA has a really broad mission within, within um, DOE. What were, what were some of the lessons you borrowed from DARPA? Th things you heard about DARPA that you thought belonged in this, in this model? All right, well, first let me talk about what we were trying to accomplish. Yeah. How DARPA was good about that. We were looking, for, there was a niche, you know, within the Department of Energy, you have just like uh, in NIH, you have a lot of research being done, but much of that research is uh, more, um, if you might call it applied research, it's more incremental research. And there was, and then if you look at the private sector, oftentimes the private sector is risk averse. You know, they're trying to make a profit. And, and, and so everybody's looking for these incremental kinds of improvements. And what RPE was gonna to try to do was give a bump uh, to that. And, but not really put products on the shelf, but rather try to make breakthroughs within this chain of successes that are needed uh, to get to a, um, uh, a successful product. Let me give you an example. Um, and what they do is five or six times a year, uh, they will have a, um, a call for proposals in different subjects. One of those, was they were trying to help the hydrogen car industry move forward. Now they weren't gonna make hydrogen cars. Right. But one of the problems with hydrogen vehicles, I should say, cars and trucks, was that because of the pressure uh, with the hydrogen, uh, it made the, the, the hydrogen tank so heavy that it then made it more difficult to make a car. You can make maybe a truck, but not a car. So. Right was this call for proposals uh, for um, how do you make, how do you, how do you construct a tank that's less, um, uh, it's not as heavy. Um, and so they you know, 
put things out and they came up with that. So that was, you know, for if there were seven steps to get to a hydrogen car and they got stuck at no right. four because of the weight of the tank, it helped them get by that, then, then, then let them move forward. So that's a part of what RPE was trying to do was fill those niches with some, some new ideas and, and help um, the process move, move along. Now to your question about what do we know from, from DARPA. I was talking to Tony Tether, who at that time was, well, I guess he just retired as the chairman of, of, of the director of DARPA. And he said that if he could construct a building for DARPA, he would have one bathroom and one cafeteria in the middle. <laughs> and the reason was the collaboration. He wanted people talking. And in, in ARPA E, uh, just like in an ARPA H, you, you know, you're not going to have a laboratory. You're not going to have uh, microscopes and, and test tubes. Right, you're right. Gonna have, is you're going to have managers. And you're going to have managers that are, are going to be able to filter through hundreds and maybe hopefully thousands of ideas and be able to pick those out that they think will be um, be most successful and then invest in them to try to move them forward right. and, and help their team. They don't just take the idea and do some, you know, they work with the folks that developed it to, to bring it forward. And you really need that collaborative uh, uh, idea. You know, if you're gonna build a house, you really ought to talk to the electrician and the plumber both get their ideas so you don't yeah. get the fires and the plumbing, you know, mixed up. And, and so the other thing that we wanted at, at, at RPE was a sense of urgency. You know, uh, this was, there was no incrementalness here. We wanted, we wanted a sense of urgency. Right. Uh, and so we, uh, we set up a system where we bypassed all the federal hire, hiring uh, norms. And you could talk to somebody in the morning and then hire them that afternoon. And they only had a two year, um, really time period. Now you could get, you know, if there was something going on, you could get an extension for it. But this was, so this was, you know, again, this sense of urgency. So oftentimes um, these, these researchers or vetters, managers uh, would leave their families at home uh, and maybe go back and visit on, on the weekend wow. because they didn't want to move their kids. Now, this, this wasn't everybody. And we did that for two reasons. One, we wanted that urgency. And the other thing is that we wanted to go into the academic community, to the to the uh, private sector community, and pull out the best folks that we could find. And if we told them we're only going to take them for two years, and this is going to be a very prestigious appointment, yeah, able to get you know the so-called uh, best and brightest. And also by you know being together, they talked about this all the time. They talked about you know, from one perspective, from another perspective, yeah. ate, drank, you know, talked about their kids, everybody, you know, together. Now, in retrospect, uh, Mary brought up a good point the other day. And when I think about it, there weren't as many women uh, because it was more difficult for them maybe to leave. And, and, you know, there is a reason that you have diversity because again, we're talking about different ideas, different perspectives. Yeah. And I think in an ARPA H, we're going to have to look at a the hybrid that that the rest of the world is going to be looking at. C clearly, there's got to be some interaction, but we're going to have to work in yeah. uh, being able to have some uh, virtual so that um, we can have more diversity in 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 the group because you'll have better ideas. Well, you know what you said is important, and to me, it, it helps me conceptualize. Um, what we have now versus the place ARPA-H would be. So if you look at a hydrogen, trying to make this hydrogen engine work, someone has to explain how hydrogen works, right? So there has to be that basic research that, you know, if Department of Energy, if it was health, it would be NIH researchers are funded to do. And then you are, you get to an applied place where you pull from industry, you pull from academia and you bring this group, this diverse group together to make use of knowledge that exists and to solve a particular problem. So it's purpose-driven research basically or use-driven research. And then you hand that to industry to manufacture and build out. It sounds like that's the gap. It's like high yeah, risk, yeah, high reward, yeah. get it done. Yeah, this was- it, Not it, basic. Yeah, I should make clear this, this did not, was not a substitute for anything at the Department of Energy, right? And uh, should not be a you know substitute for anything at the Department of 
uh, I mean, of NIH or elsewhere. You know, they're complementary. They serve different roles. Yeah. And, um, and 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 so I think as we go through this, we want to be sure that NIH is not cannibalized for an ARPA-H, but rather is enhanced with ARPA-H. That makes that makes so much sense. So what? Um... You used a term, and I, I I should remember it, but was it program managers? So it was a you kind of brought an MBA kind of of um, is that right for the folks that were managing? They manage contracts or no 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 that they no? well at first we brought in for lack of a better term scientists researchers folks that had deep knowledge often you know mostly PhDs in an area of of in applied materials or whatever it might be, electronics. Um, and so, so that one, they could understand this, the concept that were being presented. Uh, and so, you know, because if you didn't really have a deep knowledge, you wouldn't know what these concepts were. Yeah. It was really trying to, you know, find, you know, the ones that best fit their needs. Later, we then brought in sort of another layer of what you might call business folks. And we made these made, you know, if you were to get a grant from RPE, then you would have to put a business plan together. And so, you know, it was helping. And oftentimes, you know, these might be, you know, a couple of young women out of, out of Middle Tennessee State University that had a good idea and they needed a PhD kind of person to help them work through that. Uh, and that's the other thing I maybe, you know, we would send out, or they would send out large, cast a large net. So you weren't fishing in the same pond with the same ideas. You know, you were trying to get the good ideas from all across the country and then uh, help be somewhat of an incubator for them. And then get them, oftentimes you had to get them to the next tranche of money. Sometimes because there were different programs within the uh, Department of Energy or, or BSIR or, uh, or other kinds of programs and RP would get them up and the private sector said, we're you know, not ready for that yet. So we get them over to one more federal program that would then take them a little bit stuff up you know, to uh, wh wherever it might be um, to the um, beyond the concept to uh, more of a proof of concept. Makes so much sense. And one thing you mentioned to me that I thought was really interesting was that sometimes you had a surfeit of good ideas and didn't you take them? They had conferences or they had summits where folks could come and pick up a. Yeah, what, uh, you know, and, and maybe um, within the energy community, ARPA-E was very, very highly thought of and respected. And it became almost a cult. And they had, uh, you know, a yearly gathering. And so because of that, it had credibility when it came forth with ideas. And so Steve Chu was the first um, secretary of education and he came to see me uh, and I said, you know, Mr. Future Secretary at that time, <laughs> uh, you're gonna, in my opinion, you're gonna have more good ideas. They're gonna come in to you or come into RPE than you're gonna have money um, to uh, uh, invest. And so you should set up some type of a fair so that we could go to the private sector and say, you know, we had uh, 10 ideas that came in on this project and five of them were really good, um, but we only had funding for these three and th those three best fit what we were really trying to accomplish at this time. But here are others that we really looked at, they're good and, and we recommend. And because uh, there was this, uh, you know, feeling of respect for the betters, for the agency, uh, then the private sector would also oftentimes pick those up and, and go with them. I think I really like that model because again, it's, it's high risk, high reward. You're really not certain that this is gonna go anywhere. So you really can't get an investor, but it does go somewhere. It doesn't go all the way, but it goes somewhere and then it gets picked up. Well, by the also at, these, at these, this, you know, I called it a fair, you know, I told Steve, your lawyers are going to give you a hundred reasons why you can't do this and go back to them and say, give me one reason why we can. And so within, you know, just a few months, they had it set up, which was a kind of attitude. You know, there was a, 
an attitude there. So, you know, it was like, if you tell me I can't do something, by golly, you know, I'm going to do it. Right. Uh, and and that's what you, that's why this reinforcement of folks uh, working together. But it, at, and I call it a fair, but they wound up calling it a summit. Um, and they would also demonstrate the ideas that they funded. And the sector would come in. And I mean, it was like, you know, it, it was Christmas for <laughs> to come in and look at all these ideas and, uh, and, you know, pick the ones that best fit what they were doing. And uh, Congressman, um, I remember you, you mentioning something about um, like physical space, like ARPA, ARPA E is not housed within DOE. Is that right? It's in, um, it's like next door or it's in a different type yeah, of. Yeah, we, what they found, uh, they found some, you know, uh, well, department. Oops, your brick a little bit freezing up from, I hope it's not my. The energy is right there on Lafayette Plaza area. And there, and there was a private building right behind and they got a floor uh, there. They wanted to be close. And it's very important that um, the head of ARPA he reported directly to the, the secretary of energy because we wanted to keep them out of any kind of bureaucracy where they could work you know, on their own. And to some extent, they needed to be out of the, the normal flow of things because they, they did things differently. Differently. And so, yes, it was, so it was housed outside. Again, no, no equipment, just managers. Um, and, um, uh, and so, and, and then you had some administrative folks there too. So interesting. Um, I'm so tempted though, before we go to questions, we have a little, when we were, before we started today, we had a beautiful picture, a lovely picture of Congressman Gordon. And he said, is that my picture? And then he told the story. Congressman, you have to tell that story one more time and then we'll go to questions and answers. Well, I didn't always have blonde hair. Uh, <laughs> and when I was in college, uh, I ran for student body president and um, I had a friend who was taking a photography course and um, she said she would take a picture of me. So I said, great, you know, so she did. I didn't like it. So she took another, I didn't like it. And so finally she said, if you take a picture of a tree, you get a tree. So <laughs> there you have it. <laughs> I just love that story. Um, um, hey, Terry, are you ready to join us with questions? Yes, we have quite a few already. So thank you everyone for typing those in and, and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, so first, uh, let me see, where do I wanna start? Um, can you talk a little bit maybe about the possible difference in mission between this proposed ARPA-H and uh, NCATS, which is the National uh, for Translational Medicine? Any sense of maybe how that might um, overlay? You know, I really don't, you know. Okay. I, I, so I, I would, be too speculative for me to talk about that. Sure, sure. Okay, here's another one just came in. Um, so high risk research uh, is by its nature involving some failure. Um, so how did you handle the tolerances for failure when RPE was getting started? We bragged about it. <laughs> uh, and uh, and because we had to have funding on the Hill. And, uh, and, and so they appreciated us, you know, saying, you know, this one didn't work. So we're not going to waste any more money, and we pulled it. But quite frankly, you you always learn a little something from from failures because you know don't do that again, or you know to do it a little bit differently. Um, and again, you know, uh, one parallel ARPA H, you still have to get funding from the Hill, and you know you need to be transparent uh, with all the folks within that authorization and appropriation chain. And so, uh, as I say, we just said, or they said that, you know, we had these three. Uh, we're pulling the plug on this one, and boy, we're having good luck on these other two. Great. So you talked a little bit about the culture um, at ARPA-E. Can you talk a little bit about how that was either based on or meshed with uh, the culture at larger Department of Energy? Well, you know, and I listen, listen, for 26 years, I was a bureaucrat, you know, so I'm not talking down bureaucrats, but oftentimes there is a more incremental type of approach because you don't want to have a failure. Um, and, and RPE, again, was high risk, high reward. You were there for two, for two uh, years. Uh, and so we really didn't want to mix those two cultures. And I'll tell you, it was <clears throat> still inspiring to me. 
uh, when Steve Chu came to <clears throat> came to uh, speak to the first batch of managers, he said that <clears throat> he said their mission was to save the world. Wow. And these people, you know, they believed it. And that's what they did. They came in every day, you know, to try to find a way to save the world. And at that time, saving the world was um, uh, the concern about our energy independence yeah. and, and how it would impact us. But that was the idea. And it was about that time that the movie Band of Brothers came out. And oh. themselves as Band of Brothers working together. Wow. A real mission. Oh, my goodness. Oh, that's interesting. So um, another way, another question that's come up thinking about that sort of culture. And if you think of Band of Brothers, of all of these different can, people who are contributing in and off in a department like Department of Energy, you have all these different offices. You've got the national labs, you've got all these different pieces. So um, any sense of how they collaborated across those other agencies or sub agencies as well, and how that might apply to the health side? Well, I think they I think they were, and I think you have to be aware of where are the other federal assets in terms of money and expertise. So that um, again, they were managing this little group that, that had an idea. And they might say, you know, the department uh, or Oak Ridge National Laboratory has been doing something like that. Let me put you in contact with them and see if there is some collaboration. Or um, SBIR is a good next set of funding. And so, yes, I, you know, it needed to be um, both unique, but they, they needed to know where to reach out for other expertise or additional funding. Yeah. So um, when this all started, um, was there pushback or was there uneasiness um, at DOE about this possibility? Were there concerns oh, about sure. appropriations and yeah. how were those overcome? Well, um, you know, there's always concern about rocking the boat, doing things differently. Are you going to take money from other Department of Energy? And as the appropriators, you know, you know, they've got more ask than they have money for already. And, you know, what you'd have, you know, quite frankly, you, you got to get something started. And Pete Vyskoski, best his heart, uh, came in with me in 1984 when we were elected. He was uh, uh, the, the member of the energy uh, sub or uh, energy and water on appropriation said, Pete, give me $5 million to, you know, at least get this thing set up. And he said, all right, we will. And so we were able to use that to get it set up. So yes, there's going to be, there's going to be opposition early on, but once you get it set up, you're transparent um, and you show what you can do and where your role is, uh, then you can move forward. But uh, yes, there will definitely be some pushback. And there'll be and there'll be some conflict, but that's, that's all the more reason that you really have to hire top people that can communicate that. Now, um, it's been pointed out that health has a lot of different competing interests. So when uh, when RPE was setting its priorities and uh, looking at how to to what to focus on, how did it manage um, some of these different competing voices? How do you how do you choose? Well, I mean, I, uh, I, think, I think what they tried to do is they looked first, what were the promising areas of research? And then what were those things that were needed? I think they would probably, you know, they would look at what was going on in the Department of Energy, like in the hydrogen might be an example, or maybe someone needed a more uh, efficient material to get something done yeah. or a lighter material. And so I think they rather, I mean, there were, sometimes they would have best idea calls and people would just send, you know, they'd fund whatever the best ideas. But normally it was trying to find some niche within things that were already going on and how they could help it be done better. You know, I think about it in terms of um, the pandemic we're in. Would it be possible to develop a more robust reagent? or one that you could make more quickly, more of it more quickly, something you know, like that. Ellie, I was thinking the same thing this morning, a part of the problem, you know, an ARPA-E or, or an ARPA-H role would not be to develop a vaccine, but to help in that process. And we're seeing, as you pointed out right now, there is a 
a scarcity of some agents uh, or reagents to, to be able to make the vaccine. And so I could very well see a funding that would say, okay, come up with a better or an alternative, a different way that we can have these different elements. Yeah. Um, and so that would be, uh, you know, something they would, they, they could do. That's a good example, I think. All right, I've got, I think, just one more question before I turn it back to you, Ellie. Um, there are already a lot of other ARPAs, right? There is ARPA-E, there is an ARPA for defense, there's one for intelligence, there might even be more. Um, should we go in this direction? Is there value on having some sort of bridge or connection among all of the ARPAs? Well, Research America and others worked to have the OSTP director move to a cabinet level position. And so many of these uh, uh, sort of research areas are multidisciplinary. And quite frankly, to get the money, you have to look sometimes multi-agency. So I, I don't think they are, there is not a carbon copy, but there are lessons yeah. learned and that there should be collaboration. Uh, and I think probably OSTP is a good place to uh, be talking about how they can be different and how they can be um, the same. And also to make a rec, ultimately they need to be making recommendations to the president. The president's gonna drive a lot of this. The president's gonna drive, the president is not for it and the president is not, re, not making recommendations for funding. It's gonna be hard to do. I really like that because I think you have coordination, collaboration, and then you have control, right? You need the coordination, the collaboration, and that's something OSTP could do to make sure there's not duplication of effort. But it's not top down with these ARPAs that have different, fundamentally different um, points of view. They're looking at different problems. Yes. So it's a really, it seems to me, a very good role for OSTP, particularly with a cabinet level position. And these are major problems for yeah. society. So. Yeah, ARPA um, E uh, was not a copy of DARPA, but ARPA E learned. Uh, lessons. Exactly. Right. And I guess with, with ARPA-C, ARPA-H, it's got to be the same because the nature of the problems are different and the natures of the community around the research ecosystem are different too. Um, so any, any final words for us? We could keep you here forever. <laughs> well, I, this is such an forever. I, love, I Well, I, I, I would suggest people, um, that are interested to go to the RPE website. I think you can, you know, you can learn some more there. Um, I think that folks should have a very positive attitude that no one person probably is going to set up the structure and have everything just the way they want it. Uh, uh, just as you collaborate, you know, uh, in trying to have research, there'll be a collaboration of ideas and you and we'll put them together. At the end of the day, we all should be supportive of how this comes out and try to make it work best. Perfect. And, you know, I think one of the things you said that kind of almost brought tears to my eyes has to do about saving the world because, um, because of your role in it, um, in establishing these kind of really nimble um, processes and, and how important it is to the future of our, our country and society. So thank you for that and a million other things, Congressman, and for this half an hour um, of your time. Uh, so I know I have housekeeping. I know there's something. <laughs> ah, yes. <laughs> so could you all think about joining us next week? I think this is going to be very exciting. We're going to kind of get inside uh, JHU's decision to um, develop this resource that, uh, you know, everyone across the globe is using to advance um, pandemic um, response. So COVID-19 against JHU, and I think JHU is winning. <laughs> so um, we'll see you hopefully Tuesday, May 25th. And we have other very exciting um, guests joining us coming up. So thank you all. Uh, take care. <laughs>